Welcome to the Strap and Link Podcast, where we cover brands from their inception to their latest release. It's the Montress to like a better movement, spring drive so potentially, Rolex Oyster Perpetual. Oh, yeah, super Ocean, Super Ocean here. Now you see this kind of renaissance of two. Finally, in 2016, they achieved the spring drive with an eight day power. The podcast for watch lovers, by watch lovers. New episodes every first and third Monday of the month. We'll see how it goes. I mean, I'm excited though. This is Omega, big brand, so pretty pumped. Uh, before we get into all that though, um, a quick outline for listeners, whether you're new or you've been here before today, just like always, we're going to go over some history, but however, we are also going to do the very first strap and link giveaway. So we're going to let you know a little bit about that right after the history portion of the show is wrapped up. Of course, we'll go into collections. We'll talk about some of our favorites, go into some detailed discussion, and then we'll wrap up with a mailbag couple of new things today so we'll get some questions this is all news to from, me so um, i'll be uh i'll be the same shocked as you guys are as brad i guess is hosting you, all this he knows the, everything <laughs> you get the you get the notes just like i mean i make this the is notes, turned into a nice notes. podcast oh my god <laughs> <laughs> well i mean i hope other people think that but i mean yeah. you know you know we're uh we're we're, we're we're trying to keep people engaged you know we're trying uh-huh. to keep people okay fresh. i'm liking it i'm liking yeah. it yeah, man. Um, well, I gotta so say, uh, yeah. Well, well. Before we go there, I was gonna say a quick update on one of our not our most recent, but second to last episode, uh, new watch alert with the Grand Seiko Bamboo. Just gotta say, this thing gets more fun every time that I put it on. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a post out by the time that this episode releases. It'll be you know because we're not releasing this for about a week and a half, two weeks or so. Um, so I have a post that's going to come out, but yeah, I just wanted to share that, man. Like this bamboo, I've, I don't know. I'm, I'm actually really happy that I took the snowflake back. Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just the texture on it. I think is, uh, it pops a little bit more. It's kind of cool because when you get a bunch of natural light, um, it, it stays like on the green side and natural light, but artificial light, if you're walking around the house or something like that, the the green will shift shades and almost pops in like a yellow so hmm. it's a really cool watch uh, i'm i'm a little nervous about like the winter time trying to wear it cuz i think i'm going to try to go leather strap uh put it in the winter like a black yeah. or brown i don't know what that's going to look like though and it's really hard to find pictures of this yeah. watch on a strap so yeah it's kind we'll of a newer newer more rare watch you hardly ever see those around or Obviously, I've never seen one other than yours. Um, I've gotten a lot of compliments, though, about it. You know, even my, my dad was like, I saw him the other day. He's like, man, I really like that green watch. I like it much better than the Snowflake, too. And I was like, told you. I was like, yeah, he did, too. That's why he bought it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, <clears throat> so I'm getting a lot of good uh, compliments on it. So I think it looks good. And we'll figure it out. You know, it's a good summer watch, but it looks good in the winter, too, I'm sure. Just got to find the right color. Leather strap is the big thing. Right, right. Well, yeah, let's go ahead and jump into uh, to Omega, into the episode. Um, you know, on our last episode with Breitling, we talked about like, when do you approach Breitling? And that was kind of like, mm-hmm. that's kind of my theme around it. Um, my theme today, I thought was, um, you know, interesting as I was doing a lot of research and just <laughs> seeing the the vastness of the Omega collection. I mean, mm-hmm. they have a model. They have a variation for everything. Yeah. Um, we'll talk about that later, but the question here and the theme I'm going to try to loosely focus on throughout the show, uh, if you, if, if Omega was your one and only option as a watch collector, Mm -hmm. could you go your entire life with just their watch catalog and still be able to check all those boxes for all those occasions? Um, and we're not going like cost agnostic. We're talking about the cost that they have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but just the fact that this one brand has so many variations, could you do that as a watch collector? Do you think? Uh, Yeah, it's funny that you, it's funny that you bring that up because, um, you know, Omega to me is like a final watch brand where it's like, Hey, this is, this could definitely for a lot of people be your nicest brand that you own. You know, you can start with a Tudor, a long jeans, a, uh, Tiso, whatever. And then you have, but I have this really nice Omega and, you know, I think Breitling's almost there and it might end up being there at some point, but like, I mean, a lot of people say, Oh my God, you have an Omega that they speak this and it's just as popular as a Rolex is in that same category. And so I, I definitely think that you can definitely, you know, 
stay within this brand, just like you can stay within Rolex. I mean, you're getting up there to that popularity of everybody knows Omega. Everybody would love an Omega. And so it's very prestigious to own one. So I definitely think you could stick within this one brand forever. And especially like you said, with their vast array of everything they offer and most of the stuff they offer is much more affordable than if you wanted to try to do that with Rolex. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's more available too. I I don't even, Oh yeah. I mean, if someone were to ask me that question, I would probably say yes, but I think my response would be like, I mean, yeah, but there's a lot of brands that could do that for me. I don't know if Tudor could do that. I don't know if, if Grand Seiko could do that for me. I definitely think that Omega, I definitely think Rolex could. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. I was just, I was agreeing. I was like, I, I think this is probably that perfect, you know, for a avid watch collector, not somebody that just cares about a few hundred dollar worth of watches, but you know, talking about somebody like us, this is the watch that it's available. It's affordable to an extent, you know, it's not crazy. Twenty, thirty thousand dollar watches It's five to 10 mostly. And yeah, they have such a, a vast array of everything. They have a great looking diver watch. They have a great looking dress watch, the constellation, the speed, the chronographs. I mean, they have, they hit literally all the nails on the head, like in my opinion, and I know you might may differ, but in my opinion, Rolex does, they hit them just as well, but they're more affordable, but they're still just as popular and famous as Rolex. So it's like, it's the best. It's a no brainer to me. Grand Seiko. I know you love them, but me and you can both agree that their diver watches are not to the, our standard and not what we like. So I couldn't do that with Grand Seiko. I couldn't yeah. do that with Tudor. It leaves too much wanting a lot of their watches. This is finally one of those brands where you're like, I could own five of these. If you said pick five Omegas, I could do it in 30 seconds. Okay. I like it. I like it. Cool. All right. Well, uh, let's go ahead and uh, jump into some Omega history here. So I'm sure that uh, many of us know some of the highlights, but uh, we'll 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 try to give you some of the maybe lesser known facts as well. So, uh, Omega founded by Louis Brandt in 1848 in Switzerland, of course, where uh, Louis Brandt began assembling pocket watches. He was a watchmaker, had a small shop there, um, and I mean, basically, just over the years, I mean, his attention to detail and commitment, you know, building these different pocket watches really helped to gain popularity, and ultimately, that popularity grew. Uh, the brand's demand steadily. So in 1879, his two sons, Louis, uh, Louis, I'm sure, <laughs> Louis Paul and Cesar Caesar took over the family business after Louis unfortunately passed away. And under their leadership, the company actually underwent a ton of expansion. So they introduced some modern production methods as well as some new and innovative techniques in the world of watchmaking just in general, which of course enhanced and um, enhance the quality of their timepieces, but also, of course, efficiency and precision of the actual watches themselves and the movements they're in. In 1894, the brand launched a revolutionary movement, the Omega Caliber. And this is actually where the brand got their name. So uh, this new caliber, the Omega Caliber, is where the moniker Omega stuck. Um, and of course, this movement showcased, I mean, basically at the time, exceptional accuracy and reliability earning that prestigious reputation around the world. Um, and again, that's how the company actually got their name. So, Yeah, very cool. I'll kind of hop in here. Um, you see, in 1940, Omega was actually the single largest supplier for the British Armed Forces and their European allies during World War II, which was kind of cool. And because of this, they actually had to fast track all of their water resistance and shock resistance to be at the level that the militaries needed at that time. So it really pushed them on to, hey, we got to do this right and we got to do this quick, which I think helped them in the long run. But in 1948, probably Omega's greatest achievement happened when they uh, launched their iconic now Seamaster collection. Originating from Omega's military prowess and needs during the Second World War, it was built to withstand any challenge at really any altitude or, of course, being below the ocean surface. Yeah, so in 1952, this really started. These next 50 years, I feel like, were you know Omega's glory days. Um, not to say they aren't still as good now, but this is when they really just took the world by storm, in my opinion. So in 1952, they released their first Constellation watch, and this was named after the eight stars that are emblazoned on its crest, which took the world by storm for its unforgettable precision and classy look. It's really one of my favorites still today. 
Later in the decade, they came out with their first Lady Matic watch, combining the classy look of the Constellation in a compact size, which, again, took the world's ladies by storm. <laughs> uh, rounding out the 1950s, this is kind of crazy to me that they came out with three, really two of their top three watches still today came out within the same year with what they called the big three. So this was the Speedmaster, the Seamaster 300, which is now today known as the S&P 300, which is just Seamaster Pro 300, and the Railmaster. It's kind of crazy again <laughs> that yeah. you can come out with these three and you just hit the world by that's, storm one time. That's definitely new. I mean, I don't think we've covered any brand that had, I mean, even like five years between, you know, mm-hmm. uh, their their staple pieces. I mean, yeah, that's that's wild that they did two in, in the same year. Exactly. So then you're jumping to the 1960s where JFK actually wore their slimline watch at his inauguration that he was gifted from his uh, friend with his initials engraved or actually name engraved on the back, which again put Omega in the forefront of the public size and popularized them and kept them you know, up there with all the big names at the time. Um, in 1962, the first Speedmaster was actually worn in space, which is cool. It did six orbits around the Earth. And uh, it really cemented, it caught NASA's attention at this point and said, okay, this might be a watch that we want to use for our future missions, which is why in 1965, NASA actually approves the Speedmaster for use in all of their upcoming missions. And of course, this led into 1969 when it was the first watch worn on the moon and caught its uh, tag that's still used today as the moon watch. Oh, moon watch, baby. Moon watch. Come on. If you don't like the moon watch, <laughs> you should get the hell out of watch collecting. Like everybody loves the moon watch. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's probably such a small people I just yelled at, <laughs> but there's probably <laughs> at least at least five percent or ten percent of watch collectors that are yeah, turn their nose up at it. Get out of here, man. Mm-hmm. I mean, the special exactly. editions are really cool too. I I mean, I'll talk a, a just a little bit about that later on. Some special editions and my favorite ones, mm-hmm. but the fact that uh, they have released some really unique special edition ones is cool to me because. You don't see that with like with a lot of other brands, you know, I mean, exactly. there's, there's and, and it's like funny you said that branded stuff. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's like corporate branded stuff, but I mean, the way that they've done it is totally unique. So it's awesome. mm-hmm. yeah, it's funny you said that because actually in 1970 was when that watch was given the silver Snoopy award, which was mm-hmm. the highest distinction award by NASA. So of course everybody knows the 40th anniversary was the Snoopy watch where, you know, the blue and Snoopy went over the moon and, mm-hmm. and all the cool stuff. That watch is very expensive now to buy yes, aftermarket. It but it all originated from 1970 when they were awarded that by NASA for all of the work it did in the 1969 hey, mission. Question on that. Um, so I was kind of, I was a little bit confused. I didn't I didn't do a lot of research into this. I knew that you were could be talking uh, talking primarily about like this particular. But so the Silver mm-hmm. Snoopy Award from NASA. Do you know like is that just like does that have anything to do with uh, Charlie Brown? And the cartoon or like, what's yeah, the, like, how did they, how did I, they get that from NASA? Cause I always thought that that was an Omega thing and then mm-hmm. found out it was a NASA thing and Omega took the, either the name or the character Snoopy from NASA mm-hmm. and then put that into mm-hmm. the watches. Do you know if that's a, like from the cartoon or what? So, yeah, it says is as a mark of gratitude for the contributions, the success of humans in spaceflight missions, as well as the successful return of Apollo 13, Omega was presented the Silver Snoopy Award. And it says the award was first created by Snoopy was chosen this name. I'm sorry. Snoopy was okay. chosen because they had the ability to keep things light in serious situations. So that's actually what's on their website is why they chose Snoopy. <laughs> and okay. That's why they, yeah. And it emphasized mission success as, and an act as a watchdog. Okay. For, cool. for so, Earth into space. Yeah. So they're saying that, you know, hey, these were the watchdogs of Earth for whole, all of space at the time. Got it. Okay. Well, that's pretty damn cool. I'm glad I yeah. know that now. Yeah. Okay. It's pretty that's cool. cool. Kind of different. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> everybody's wondering, Snoopy just seems very random. I know. Well, I mean, again, like I always thought it was uh, like an Omega thing. I thought they, Mm-hmm. pick some cartoon or whatever, like whatever the thought process was. So yeah, very cool to hear about that. And now, mm-hmm. now I know. Yeah. So then um, again, this watch was used for all the following Apollo missions throughout the years. And uh, in the 1980s, this was actually again, touted as the most accurate watch in the world. So this watch was actually in 1993 sent up to space for a full year in a Russian space station, 365 days. And when it came back, 
they said it was running at the same accuracy that it was running the year prior. It's incredible. Which was unheard of throughout the 60s, 70s, and when they were first trying to test this. Yeah. So very, very cool watch. Um, again, this was kind of, in my opinion, the years of the Speedmaster. You know, the Speedmaster was just all the buzz. Everybody yeah. wanted one. Very cool watch. And then as you kind of go into the late, mid to late 90s and all through the 2000s, the Seamaster Professional, the S&P 300, really took the world by storm. Of course, this is because James Bond, it started appearing in all the James Bond um, movies. Uh, whether it was pre Pierce Brosnan or Daniel Craig carried on that after the Pierce Brosnan movies. movies. Yeah, man, that's a, I mean, that's a damn good watch. And um, as you're talking about that, I was thinking like, I, I would love to see, I would love to see um, sales numbers for mm -hmm. like in the eighties and the nineties for, for the speedy compared. To, well, I guess, I guess it'd probably be like Omega sales. So like Omega yeah. compared to, you know, any other brand, I would love to see <clears throat> some of that data. I wish I'd pulled it up for the podcast. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll touch on that later. Um, yeah. Cause yeah, I mean, that's like, yeah. Height of the space wars or what do they call it? The space race. The like space was, race. Yeah. yeah. I was born in 94. So I didn't, I didn't get to see any of this stuff. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know a whole lot about it either. Uh, but I bet that was, uh, if you have a, big world event going on like the space race was and this mm -hmm. one company has a watch that they sit up there for a full year yeah i could imagine people flocking to omega dealers to, to get that watch exactly and that was i think you know of course we weren't around them but i can just imagine that was really the young man's watch at the time where now the s p 300 because of these movies and everybody knows the james bond's always wearing a seamaster really made these of the 2000s where every young yeah. kid, you know, young guy wants to get an Omega. When they think of Omega, they think of the Seamaster nowadays because it's always in these movies. Yeah, that's a really good point. Not thought mm -hmm. about that. That's a good, very, very good point. Yeah, so then later on after the uh, S the Seamaster 300 came out, they actually came out with a uh, another version of their Seamaster collection, which I know is probably your favorite of Megan. One of my top top three, definitely, um, with the Aqua Terra. So do you kind of want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. Um, I'll talk about, uh, well, I'll keep it um, the way that I kind of uh, prepped and everything, uh, keep the timeline kind of linear. Let's talk about the coaxial movement first. So, uh, Omega's coaxial movement, um, pretty pretty amazing advancement in watchmaking. So, this was introduced in 1999, and we've said it on the show before. We're not watch uh, movement aficionados, so I'm not going to pretend to be. But I'll try to put this in layman's terms from my understanding of my research. So, mm -hmm. traditionally, mechanical watches they use a lever escapement. And that lever escapement requires lubrication to minimize the friction between all the different components. If you've ever watched one of those like Instagram reels where a watchmaker is servicing an old beat up watch and they take every little thing out, you know how many components we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So all that friction over time, of course, it just leads to wear and tear. Think of your car, right? You put 200,000 miles on that thing. You can have to replace some belts, some hoses, tires, brakes, all that kind of stuff, right? So over oh, yeah. time it wears and tears, uh, but it also affects accuracy over time. So, the coaxial escapement, on the other hand, this actually reduces the need for lubrication and decreases friction. So in layman's terms, what this is doing is it's transmitting the energy more efficiently. And the design overall involves a combination of radial and lateral movements, all of which reduces that sliding friction. From what I've kind of read and understand, the sliding friction that's mm -hmm. present in a traditional lever escapement. So the result here is overall improved precision, but also increased longevity of the actual movement itself. Uh, so we're talking less frequent service intervals and that watch stays running accurate for longer compared to a traditional uh, lever escapement. So the reduced friction in the coaxial movement also means that the watch requires less frequent servicing, like I just said. And presently, uh, the Aquaterra, the Constellation, the Speedy, the S&P, well, sorry, I shouldn't say S&P, a lot of the Seamaster collection, but including the S&P 300 and also the DeVille models all use some coaxial movement. So it's pretty neat. Um, you just mentioned the Aquaterra. This was initially released in uh, 2002. Definitely one of my favorites, if not actually my favorite of all Omegas. Um, mm -hmm. Very distinctive design. If you've ever seen one, most of you probably have with a pretty symmetrical dial that's got... Um, 
they call it like a teak pattern, which is inspired by like the wooden, uh, the wooden planks or (laughs) shouldn't say wooden planks. You know, we're, we're not walking the plank by the wooden, uh, decks of like a luxury sailboat or luxury yacht or something like that. And it's pretty cool. I just watched a video, um, that had some, some, uh, some micro shots and it's cool because I never seen this or never noticed it rather before, but the, the lines on this dial are not only sunburst effect, which is cool because I did not also know that, but they are sunburst, um, or there is rather a sunburst effect. They're graded so that there's like a little divot that creates all these different symmetrical lines, but they're actually not symmetrical. There's like three raised lines that are surrounded by two lowered or like two lower divoted lines. So it's actually pretty cool. The The whole dial itself is symmetrical, but if you're looking at like one individual line, like I used to think that they were all sort of the same, they're actually not. So um, very distinctive design. All of that is to say, um, and yeah, I mean the Aqua Terra line, I'll get into this in just a minute, ton of models, like mm-hmm. every size, every material complications, uh, oh, yeah. uh, what, what I say, material colors, everything like world time <laughs> complications. It's, it's insane. They actually just released, um, in May, 2023, just released, uh, additional green colorways along with titanium. The titanium joins platinum and of course, stainless steel. So that collection has really been, it's really been blown up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, that is one of the most popular models that we've seen. Um, we have one in my family and obviously I want one. Yeah. With a uh, gray, dark gray dial with blue hour markers. It's, okay. it's cool. Yeah. It's I know exactly cool. the model you're talking about. Yeah. So yeah. Great, great reviews for that one. Um, But moving on back to, you know, kind of today, uh, the moon watch professional actually came out in 2021, reimagining the back and the bracelet of the watch, making it really fit more comfortable. It's what I've heard on people's wrists, which was the one halfway complaint about a Speedmaster um, that we've heard in the past is just the, the bracelet. It doesn't fit. It doesn't have all those micro adjustments to fit everybody's wrist. Yeah. But one watch that I think is very underrated. I've never, I've never uh, seen one in person, never even really heard of this, but is the uh, Seamaster Ultra Deep, which resembles and to me is the brother and the bigger and better brother of the deep sea dweller from Rolex. Um, (laughs) I was just doing some research there while you were talking. A a deep sea sea dweller is 3,900 meters water resistance. It's ridiculous. That's 12,000 feet. That's 12,000 feet. So that's, that's a big daddy. The yeah. ultra deep. Can you get, it's almost double the water resistance. It is 20,000 feet of water resistance. It's is insane. The, is the Omega ultra deep. It, so, it almost doubles Rolex. <laughs> so have you heard the story of how the, the, how the ultra deep beat the deep sea record? Have you heard that story? Uh, mm-mm. So I just heard this last night doing some research. Um, so James Cameron guy that directed yeah. titanic right I, yeah wait hold on i think he directed Ti- again i was born yeah, in he did he did people. well that's why the ultra deep is is uh <laughs> is called the james Cam or not the ultra deep the deep sea is called sea. the james cameron because of that movie. oh well yes. i don't even know that all right yeah shows yeah. how much i know <laughs> okay well yeah so james cameron direct directed titanic um i don't mm-hmm. know how much of that sub submarine thing is real but i do know that they did send a deep sea down in one of those things at some point with James Cameron, I guess. And so yep. they set the record for the deepest dive of a watch with a Rolex deep sea, mm-hmm. the Seamaster ultra deep. I don't have like, I didn't get it like too crazy into all the details of this, but they dove like a hundred feet deeper than just the James <laughs> Cameron dive just to beat it. So the yeah. Seamaster ultra deep now has the rec- the world record or the deepest dive of any watch ever recorded. And they beat James Cameron's watch by like a hundred, maybe 200 feet. Well, there you go. And it's rated for just under 8,000 more feet deep of water resistance. It's saying what they say it can go to. Yeah. And obviously it's probably never been done. 20,000 feet is a very deep, but it is rated 6,000 meters yeah. of water resistance versus 3,900 on the deep sea. 
Well, you know, we just talked to the to the co-owners at Monta and they were kind of explaining how how like water rating and water resistance works. It's like, Mm -hmm. of course, on the dial, it'll it'll give you a meter or a foot marker Mm -hmm. to kind of play with. But, um, you know, I mean, it's 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 pressure, really. Like it's not it's not depth, right? Like the depth is like water is water wherever you're at. But obviously, the deeper you go, the pressure just gets uh, harder and harder and harder and it mm-hmm. will just crack one of these things like wide open so mm-hmm. i mean yeah when well, you're crack us wide open at twenty thousand feet so i'm sure it'll yeah, do the same time. i mean <laughs> even yeah. even like a thousand like i'm not i i, I don't know i've never dove most people yeah. that wear these things probably never well a, a deep sea and an ultra deep maybe but um, when you get that deep yeah those are normally worn by more blue collar divers versus yes. a submariner <laughs> yes all right well um are you good on history? You want to? Yeah, I mean that's okay. it. I mean, again, we'll we'll dive deeper here into these collections. Um, you know, with the Speedmaster, the S and P three hundred, all these, we'll tell you a little bit about them and uh, we talk about them a little bit more. So let's move on. Yeah, for sure. Uh, we talked about it at the top of the episode. We're going to be doing our first ever strap and link giveaway. So want to go ahead and let everyone know what we are actually giving away and how you can enter and ultimately how you can win. So the giveaway is going to be a one watch uh, box and spinner. So automatic spinner for your automatic watches is going to be a one box holder. If you're like me, I've got one in the bedroom, but I also hang out in my office slash my podcast studio for like 10 hours a day. So I've also got one over here that I can just, you know, whatever. If I need to take it off for any reason, got a box over here. So one watch, uh, box and spinner uh, or winder, if you're more used to that vernacular. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say we're going to be doing this U.S. only, I think. I know we actually have quite an audience across uh, across the big pond over in Europe, and I love you guys. We'll probably do something for you guys specifically, but I think honestly the shipping cost would outweigh, like it would be greater than the cost of the box. So uh, it wouldn't make sense for me or for you guys to win this thing. So we're going to be doing US only, uh, but to enter this giveaway, we're going to need you to follow Strap and Link on Instagram. That's simply at Strap and Link and is spelled out. Going to need you to like this post that you're watching right now. So go ahead and like it right now. And also go ahead and comment and tag one friend. So you'll automatically be entered to win that way. We'll take a tally. And I'm sure there's some system out there. We've never done this before. You know, you guys are rocking with us for a couple months now. We've never done all this. I'm sure there's some tool out there that can automate all this for us. But that's how you're going to enter. Do those three things. Follow Strap and Link on Instagram. Like this post right here. Comment, tag a friend. You'll be entered. And so we're going to actually pick a winner when the Strap and Link Instagram account hits 350 followers. I know you guys are loyal, so we're going to wait 350. We've got about 100 more to go, and we'll be announcing that giveaway, that winner, as soon as we hit 350. Also, go ahead and be sure to rate and subscribe to the Strap and Link podcast wherever you listen, Apple, Spotify, Google, Samsung, wherever it is that you listen. That helps us. We appreciate that. Do that, but also you get alerts when we drop bonus episodes, such as the new Watch Alert episode that we just did a couple of weeks ago. So now let's go ahead and get back to the show. David's going to jump into one of his favorite Omega watches in the current collection. Yes, I will. Um, So the watch, again, we've spoke about this a lot, so let's go ahead and get to this one. The S&P 300, which just stands for Seamaster Pro 300 for the 300 meter water resistance that it has. This is probably... God, there's so many. It's like Rolex. There's so many iconic watch collections that Omega releases. I, it's hard to say this is their most popular because the Speedmaster, again, yeah. everybody knows that. The S&P 300, though, everybody knows, again, because it was is worn in pretty much all of the the Seamaster watches are worn in all of the James Bond uh, movies, the Pierce Brosnan's and the Daniel yeah. Craig, which is when I started paying attention. And the latest Daniel Craig, the 2021 was probably if you if you actually go to Omega's website, they have these all listed out of each movie that it's in and kind of gives you a little detail about each one in an actual picture that is worn of the exact watch. And so I was looking through them all. Which one's my favorite? It's just hard to beat the 2020 Daniel Craig, James Bond one that is steer still being promoted all over the website is that the black black with guilt with the guilt yeah oh yeah it's a cool with with a metal bracelet um not not just a oyster link bracelet oh that's got the mesh bracelet yeah Mm -hmm. Yeah. very cool but if you don't want that if that's not your style they offer these pretty much in every color the blue the black the greens the 
again, the 007, um, all different types of straps, rubber straps, which I love Omega's rubber straps. They're great. Again, I was just saying about the Aquaterra ones are awesome. Um, they offer this in all different kinds of shapes, arrays, sizes, all the way from 42 to 44. And I actually saw that they had a couple, maybe one or two that were actually at 36 and a quarter millimeter, which is kind I of believe different. it. Yeah, it's all stainless steel, no titanium, so no no worries there, unless you're just the, <laughs> the titanium fan. Um, the case thickness is just over 13 and a half. Again, water resistance, 300 meters, and the movement is their Omega 8800 and some around, which they'll have 8806, but their 8800 movement and their 9900 movement. So um, the beats per hour, I know... A lot of people always ask this, but I did not, I was not able to find that. So sorry to that. <laughs> but, uh, these watches vary anywhere from around five grand up to 10 grand. The, uh, James Bond, of course, being right at that $10,000 marker. Um, but again, a very popular, this is one, if you say Omega, people think of this watch and you'll see pictures of it. I'm sure we've posted a bunch. One of our friends has one of these mm-hmm. and it's really just a watch that, you it catches your eye from across the room it's it's so low key until you really look at it then it turns almost stunning you're just like man this is an awesome watch and especially if you like those a little bit bigger you know the 42 millimeters 44 millimeters if you yeah. like those a little bit thicker bigger watches but you want that sporty look i mean this is just a must have yeah the i love the rubber as well and i'm really happy that they offer a rubber mm-hmm. strap with this direct from Omega. And, yeah. um, the thing, I mean, and I think it's, I mean, it's universal. Well, I don't say it's universal, but it's pretty commonplace for people to really hate on that bracelet that comes from Omega. It mm-hmm. just, it looks, it is so clunky. Old. Yeah. And we, yeah, <laughs> it's a little clunky, but I mean, at least personally for me, the, the, the beef I have with it, it just looks old. Like, it looks like yeah. something that I would expect to see from like a late eighties or a nineties watch. Yeah. Um, yeah. something that at that time is trying to be modern and contemporary and it just in 2023, it just looks vintage. Like there's mm-hmm. no other way around it, at least for me. Um, mm-hmm. and I've, uh, yeah. So anyway, that's my kind of thing with the bracelet. The rubber though is cool. And I'll tell you what's really cool about the rubber. The th- Well, what's interesting. I w- I'm not going to say it's cool, but what's interesting about the rubber is that to me, and I think a lot of people that don't like the bracelet, they probably have a similar thought, which is the way that they go about the links, the outer links and the inner, there's an inner polish link that just looks, I guess to me, it's the way that it's made designed. I don't know the wording for it, but it just looks older. People that know this watch, they'll know what I'm talking about, mm-hmm. but that center link, um, kind of polishing that they do have. Yeah. That's sort of present on the rubber strap. If you look closely at the rubber that comes OEM from Omega on this watch, it's got two little kind of, uh, they're raised. Mm-hmm. So they're not indentations. They're kind of raised and, you know, textured yeah. sort of, uh, markers or whatever. I'm losing the, uh, losing the word there, but mm-hmm. that's cool to me that they've made the rubber strap and they've made it their own. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I think different. Rolex yeah. does that with the, with, um, some of their watches, some of like the sky dweller and the yacht master. When you see those on the oyster flex, the rubber, it's sort mm-hmm. of raised in the center. And then that raised center, it tapers in and Omega has it where it's kind of like a two sh- it's, it's like pinstriping. It's like two pinstripes on that, on the, you know, where that brushed or polished center link is rather. So yeah. I think that's the biggest thing about the, about the S and P 300 that, you know, some people really hate it because of that. It's a simple fix, like get a nice, decent 150 or $200 strap. strap. Yeah. yeah. And if you get four or five of those straps over time, yeah, I mean, you've got a totally different watch. I mean, if you have a blue dial, throw mm-hmm. white on there. Throw throw blue or black, and it all works. If mm-hmm. you have the green, do yeah. black, and it's a little more rugged military looking. Yeah. You do white with the green, like it all pops. So it's not the yeah. watch; it's just that bracelet. I wonder when they're going to update that. 
Yeah, it's very different. Um, it's very heavy. It is a heavy, <clears throat> heavy watch with the bracelet. Um, if you go with the rubber, it's not as bad. But you know, even our friend, I mean, you wouldn't. He'll let you know. I'll let him try on my sub, and he'll let me try on that, and we'll wear it for a little while. It's just a. It's heavier than the sub. It's a. It's a big boy. Um, mm-hmm. one of the cool. I almost forgot to even mention. And if you haven't seen this, you need to go look it up. But one of the coolest watches probably out there on the market is they're all black, um, ceramic, black on black, uh, S and P 300. Oh, dude, it's so cool. We, we, yeah. We've saw one of those at a watch <laughs> society, I think a meetup and whew, it's obviously yep. it's not the easiest thing to read, but it's really also you not. You can't read anything, but that's the think, coolest part about it. <laughs> yeah. It's it. Unless, unless you get that baby outside and you have some loom on it because the loom is yeah. just bright as can be, which is just the coolest thing ever. If you see somebody with the blacked out and they've had light on it, you know, they'll even, I think the guy we were there with put his flashlight on his phone on it for a few seconds mm-hmm. and let us see the loom of it. It was awesome. It's a very cool watch. I don't even think they, release the price on their website they actually just say like contact the boutique about the piece <laughs> um so it's a kind of harder more um exclusive watch to get do you but know if, if you that's ceramic person is awesome it is ceramic yeah it's okay okay yeah, yeah. Website, so it's kind of like ceramic the tudor uh black yeah yeah mm-hmm. okay yeah so it's kind of like the the black bay uh 58 or the black bay ceramic i, I think they've named it differently but yeah it's I mean, yeah, you can't read it at all. Like in the daylight, <laughs> if you got they didn't some even real try to put a light, date on there either. That's the funny thing. Like the rest no, of the S and P three hundreds have the date at the six. They're like, yeah, nobody's gonna read it. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, and it's funny. Like, and I br- I bring up the Tudor uh, Black Bay, the ceramic, basically the same thing, except for the the hour markers and those loom plots are actually white, whereas on mm-hmm. the S and P three hundred. It's all black. So Tudor went in the direction where they're like, all right, let's make this cool ceramic black watch, but we'll 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 put this pop of color so that people can use it. Omega's like, screw that. We're gonna make this watch. It's gonna be like, you know, it's it's just all mm-hmm. black. I mean, it's it's really cool. It's not legible. Yeah. But um yeah, if you if you if and when you ever see them in person, you get that chance, you'll you'll see what we're talking about. Very, very cool. Yeah. You'll probably want one. <laughs> but yeah. anyways moving on yeah. to the uh to the other sea master that is again brett that we've talked about a little bit on this episode the uh, aqua terra yeah man um yeah we've we've talked a little bit about it it's uh, yeah i think over the years it's it's definitely become my favorite um mm-hmm. the speedy well you know we also talked about this like the i mean the the speedy and the in the s&p 300 like omega is one of those few brands that they've got more than a couple like very highly iconic watches and so initially like you know i was all about the speedy and and particularly mm-hmm. the like 2020 20, was it 21s i think 21 is when yeah. they re when they, they revamped the yeah. bracelet and yeah i said and, that and on the, the bracelet it looked paying attention. Felt better look man <laughs> look we got a lot to cover a lot to cover um <laughs> Yeah, the the Speedy was always kind of like a front runner, and then just the more I think just the more variations of the, of the Aquaterra three hander yeah. uh, date window at the six o'clock on most, if not all of them, they've mm-hmm. got the shades uh, the shades collection within the Aquaterra collection. They have a it's kind of a sub genre called shades, and that is uh, it doesn't have that teak that uh, textured dial pattern that we talked about earlier, but it's got a, just a straight up sunburst effect. I yeah. don't love those as much, um, mm-hmm. but again, just more variety. So oh, yeah. um, they do have gold. Most of them are going to be stainless steel, of course. And so I'm mostly going to be talking about the stainless steel, the actually affordable ones. I'm not going to talk very much about the kind of up there and out there models. So for the sake of that, um, argument and purpose. We're talking stainless steel, 41 millimeter, uh, 13.2 millimeter on the case thickness. It's a little bit smaller than the S and P, uh, 150 meters of water resistance. So it's not a dive watch, but you get plenty of water resistance. So you're covered there. Uh, Omega 8,900 caliber, uh, which is master chronometer, which is amazing. 
Uh, this beats at 25,200 beats per hour or vibration, vibration per hour. 60 hours on the power reserve there, which is really nice. Uh, I think, yeah, once you go, once you're getting 60 and up, you know, I think you're, you're getting, that's nice because you can sort of pause for a weekend and, you know, mm-hmm. Monday you're, you're good to go. So I like that. Yeah. yeah All of this is getting at like this watch does only, everything. Yeah. And the S and P was only 55 hours. So it's even got that beat, which was kind of, it's close. It, it, yeah, it, yeah. 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 Actually, I was not expecting that. I thought the S and P 300, because just being the bulkier watch, you would expect it to have more power reserve, but this one actually beats it out by five hours. Well, I, and again, we're, we're not movement, uh, aficionados, but I'm, I'm imagining the reason for the thickness on the S and P, uh, well, partially the depth of course, but then like, I mean, they've got a helium escape valve on that thing. I don't know how mm-hmm. all of that works. We are going to get into some complications, and I'll throw a helium escape valve into that. I mean, functionality, movement, complications. There is going to be a, a whole sort of topic and discussion on that where David and I are going to learn a lot of that. But I'm imagining that mm-hmm. a lot of the thickness, at least a little bit of it, is mm-hmm. from that depth rating and just functionality there. Yeah. Um, so with that considered, like five hour difference power reserve, I'm not I'm not discounting them whatsoever for it. And 55 is still is still great. I mean talking like 40, 42, 44 hours. Um, that's, that's getting a little bit low for me, but mm-hmm. Aqua zero 41 millimeter, um, cost is going to vary widely. I mean, we've talked about how many models that they have, but, um, at yeah. the lowest end, 2750, uh, USD. So 2,750 us for some quartz models. The, the majority of the models that people are going to be looking at sit within 5,400 us and 6,300. Um, mm-hmm. These are going to be yeah. most of the 41 and the 40 or sorry, the 41. And I believe they have a 30, it's a 38 millimeter model, not 39, 38 and 41 is going to sit in that 54 to 6,300 range. These do go up, however, to like 50, 55 K for gold diamond set. They've got world timer complications. There's all kinds of stuff. There mm-hmm. are 264 variations of the Aquaterra. <laughs> As of <laughs> May the 17th on the Omega website, we talked about Tudor on our second episode of this podcast and how like I have the black and the gilt dial Black Bay 58. You can't find a rubber strap from Tudor. You can't find one from Rolex that fits it. They've got a couple of NATOs that we don't love. You're stuck. And then they only have like three dial <laughs> colors. The Aquaterra people has 264 variations. Colors, how many metal. strap, how many oh strap variations are linked? They've I mean, got scrolling like, through their websites. Crazy. Dude, they've got leather. They have rubber. They have obviously metal, gold. They have titanium. They have platinum. They have stainless steel, um, green, blue, red, shades of green, shades of orange, like everything that you could ever imagine. Mm. And, to me, I say I don't know a lot about movements because I don't know a whole lot about movements, but I'm, I do appreciate when a solid movement goes into a watch at this price point. This is uh, Master Chronometer certified at 54, 58, 6300, depending on the size and the color and the particular model. But talk about an excellent value for just an everyday watch. I mean, half the cost mm-hmm. of, well, roughly half the cost of, a Rolex date just, and you can go in and get it. Uh, they probably yeah. have every combination or variation that you would ever want. So there's a lot to love about this particular model within the collection. I know we're pushing up mm-hmm. right around one hour, so I'm going to try to speed up. I know we have a couple more watches to get to, but um, again, like I just mentioned it to me, I look at this, this is like Omega's date just to me. This is kind of that mm-hmm. do it all. It can be flashy, but it can also be subtle. It's got the water resistance, the power reserve, the movement. The pricing is is phenomenal on this thing. It's a perfectly balanced. We talked about that dress and sport. You can dress it up. You can dress it down. If I wear this thing with a white t-shirt and jeans or shorts and tinnies, it looks just as good as if I put a sport coat or a full suit on and take this thing out to a wedding. It it plays in all fields. Um my personal favorite is the green, and as far as I can tell, they've discontinued the green that I actually like. I think it's from like 2020, 21. 
which is more of like a traditional green and similar to what the bamboo Grand Seiko has. The new green is it's like olive and the shades green. I talked about that. The shades where it's just all sunburst. It doesn't have that teak pattern. Um, Mm -hmm. It's like an even worse shade. So I don't know how long they'll keep that, but I don't I don't think it looks nearly as good. Mm -hmm. It's maybe more dressy because it's like shimmery. And that older green looked more like a matte finish, but um, yeah, I just I just don't like that. Um, yeah. <clears throat> sorry, yeah, do you have something? Yeah, I was just gonna say, you know, my opinions on it. Again, I've only seen the one that my father has. He, um, it's awesome. It's gray. I love the gray and the navy blue that they incorporated with it. That rubber ish. I don't even want to say just pure rubber because it's just. I don't even know how to explain it. It's like rubber with a slight mesh on the inside. It's, it's awesome. It doesn't feel cheap. It's just something different that you don't see anywhere else. And, uh, and you know, I think this probably I'm with you and I'm, I'm just going to say it. I've came to the realization. This is my favorite Omega. If I had to buy an Omega right now, I would buy an Aquaterra. My man, my man. Yep. I mean, dude, it, it, it does everything. Like you can go into a dealer and some episode a few months back, we talked about like I was on it, on my honeymoon in in the Netherlands and went out to this went away from Amsterdam for like a day. And I found this like mm-hmm. this watch boutique on this tiny little island. I was like, what? This island has yeah. like 4000 people that live on it. And you guys have like a watch boutique that sells Brightlings and Omega. Hmm. And I went in there and I'm looking at, at an Aquaterra and my wife came in like. 20 minutes and I'm sitting there with like the sales lady and she's like, nah, you're not doing it. But <laughs> I tell that story to say the fact that you can go into basically any AD that sells Omega and you can find some uh, version of this watch and it's like six grand and it's yeah. available and it's, I love it, man. It's, um, yeah. it's by far my favorite. It's something that I will definitely have in my collection. Mm-hmm. I, it, doesn't mean it'll be in the collection in the next two years or five years. Like, I don't know, but it's something that, um, yeah, it's going to make its way there. Um, yeah. One of the last things I wanted to talk about, or I guess the two last things to wrap up, um, the newer bracelet looks amazing. I know your dad's is on that blue. I know exactly the rubber and kind of mesh pattern design that you're mm-hmm. talking about. They do have a newer bracelet version. They sell one. If you guys are thinking just a regular stainless steel bracelet from any brand, whatever. Um, You can picture what those bracelets look like. They have a newer version that's not available on all of them. I've found, I've found out it's limited to some of the certain ones. I don't know what the reasoning behind it is, but it looks more like a, like a Rolex day date. And there's no other watch brace in the world that I can think of to compare it. It just looks like the Rolex day date where the center link is a little bit elongated compared to the outer two links. So it's a three link bracelet. The center link is also polished. The outer links are brushed and that center link that's elongated, it's curved Um, and it looks really comfortable. I've never tried that particular bracelet on. It looks incredibly comfortable, but it also looks Hmm. just, it looks amazing. Like just the, the visual aesthetics to it. Um, Yeah. Now I had a note to say that if I just had my pick of the litter, I'm going to go with like the $48,000 uh, <laughs> solid gold GMT world timer complication. Uh, because I just think it's awesome, man. I mean, this thing's got a piece of, I believe titanium yeah. right in the center. And they do this, they do this uh, metal fabrication process where it, I understand it's like laser engraved almost where it cuts out the texture and the design of the globe. It's really awesome. World timer. It's got a GMT. I love GMTs. Everyone knows this. And it's like a rose gold. It's just so cool. 50K though. I'll yeah. never, I'll never own one. Um, so that's all <laughs> I've got for the Aquaterra. Uh, if you, if you have anything to add, feel free. If not, we can move on. But yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a perfect watch. Yeah. Like I said, it's, I've seen great things about it. I love it. If I, if I could buy any, I guess I would buy that one, but if since my dad owns one and you know, I don't want to sit there and copy the man, what exactly he has. I said, okay, David, what is the next Omega I would buy? And I found myself falling in love because of um, a watch uh, content creator, Teddy Baldazar. Um, 
he has this watch and I saw him post it, I think on his video of his most worn watch in 2022, he did this in December of last year. It was the Omega Constellation uh, Collection Globemaster. It's a very different watch, something that if you think of Omega, you don't really think of the Globemaster, <laughs> but it's a very subtle mix between a sport and a dress. The dial of this watch just really it is what stole the show for me. The center of it looks almost raised from the where the hour markers are. Um, it's almost like a hexagon, I would guess, shape. Um, it's I don't know. Kind of like what, a step twelve dial, corners. But... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's w- crazy. It's something different. It's very low key. This one that I look at is a thirty nine millimeter. It comes with the fluted bezel. Um, it comes with stainless steel. The link bracelet is almost like a. It's not like a normal link bracelet that you would see on the Aquaterra or a Submariner. Or, you know, something that you when you think of a link bracelet, you think of it's almost like a modernistic space, which I think also goes great with the globe master um space type material and look to it i don't know if you've ever seen one brad but it's very different than your normal just stainless steel bracelet like i yeah, said never, it comes 39 up oh, go ahead oh sorry i was just gonna say, i've never seen one in person but yeah i i, I get everything you're saying it's all brushed mm-hmm. and it looks a yeah, little very brushed. futuristic or something yeah Mm-hmm. It comes 39 to 41 millimeters, depending on what you get with a 12.6 uh, millimeter case thickness, water resistance of a hundred meters, which still is not bad. Um, it comes with the Omega 8,900 movement and 60 hours worth of uh, power reserve, which is just like the Aquatera. I think they have the same movement. Same, I'm not yeah. mistaken. This watch varies between seven to 12,000 for 98% of them. But I actually looking through their website, there's one for like 23,000 that's just tricked out. And then one for 50 plus thousand that's tricked out even more. Um, but the one I like, my favorite, it's almost like a, it's not a royal blue. It's like a turquoise blue, but leaning more towards blue. Imagine turquoise, but more blue than the green. And it dial very different, and it's around seven thousand dollars, which I don't think is very bad for that watch. A couple thousand more than your Aquaterras that you normally would get, which is fifty five to six thousand, like you were saying. Um, it's a very underrated GMT piece. I think uh, they, I'm sorry, they have a very underrated GMT piece that I also wanted to talk about. This watch is something that I didn't even know they had until um, doing the research, but they have. All the month, again, all the months in cursive between the hour markers. It's hard, again, to explain without looking at this. We'll post some pictures of it definitely before this episode comes out. So go on our Instagram and look at it. But between each hour marker has January, February, March, April. And it's all in cursive, very classy. It's a cool. It's just a cool watch. Um, again, around $12,000. My favorite one of these is actually the green dial with the sunburst dial. Um, on a green croc strap is kind of just the coolest, just something different, very dressy uh, take on the Globemaster itself. So, so you like the green because I've noticed, or I'm noticing right now, that it's a similar shade of green to what the Aquaterra green is currently offered in. You like that yeah, sort of, I, it's kind of a deep olive on this one, where it's more of like a light olive on the Aquaterra. Mm-hmm. This one's more of a deeper you like that green? Yeah, I like the I like the deep green of it just because I think it's classier and more of a dress watch than an Aquaterra would be. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, not I won't sit there and say it's my favorite green ever because I told you that I think the Breitling Super Ocean Heritage is my favorite green ever. But this is a very cool, different, just green watch if you're looking for one. Yeah, it's hard to beat. I know. Yeah, the Super Ocean Heritage you're talking about it's it's hard to beat. They've mm-hmm. Yeah, whatever they're doing with sunburst styles, it's unmatched. But Mm -hmm. yeah, this is a I mean, yeah, it's it's not the watch for me. Like, it's not my personal taste, but I Mm -hmm. get it. I mean, like in every aspect, I mean, it's it's that sporty dress watch that we're talking about. But it leans. it's maybe like 60, 40 on the dress side. Mm -hmm. It's not and it's overly dressy. Yeah, yeah, it's not your same old 
you know, this would your date just, or, you know, not saying yours is same old because having a real nice date just is great, but it's not just an Omega watch with a date and that's it. Mm-hmm. And just simple three hand Omega watch with a date. It has that, that raised dial is something different that I think is eye catching and people that haven't seen this. And a lot of people haven't will say, what the heck is that? I've never seen, seen yeah. that. Oh my God. It's very different, very cool. And just an Omega watch. And that's why I think I would buy this one if I wasn't going to buy an Aquaterra just to be different out of the crowd. So I have a question. I don't know if you know the answer to this, but I'm looking at the GMT that you're talking about. So like David is saying, the, the cursive months are written on, or, Mm -hmm. you know, they're printed or written on the dial in between Mm -hmm. the hour markers. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in between the 12 and the one is January, right? And in between the 11 yeah. and the 12 is December. So the GMT hand, because I'm, again, I'm just now processing all of this. There's not an actual 24 hour scale. It's yeah. really, it's like a perpetual calendar. So yeah, does that, I, I think does that fourth hand move in between the hour markers, depending on the day of the month? Like if it's May the 15th, is it going to set right perfectly in the middle of May? And then move yeah. its way over as the month goes. That I do not know. Um, okay, I, I was looking, saying it's more of a GMT. I guess that was probably the wrong thing to say. It's a more of an annual calendar. Um, okay. Now that's actually what they have here is the Globemaster Coaxial Master chron- Chronometer Annual Calendar, forty-one millimeter. It's the full okay. mouthful of what it is. Um, that it just has the so GMT logo, but that's that very they, interesting. I don't know. You yeah. maybe it will be that. That's something I wish I could see. I'm sure you could look it up on YouTube and uh, see one. Yeah, because I'm not. I mean, I don't think either of us are rich enough to own a perpetual calendar or annual. I mean, typically those complications are reserved for some pretty high horological pieces and very mm-hmm. pricey. But yeah, I'm just I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, okay, most because most annual calendars that you see are either on like a sub dial. And Mm -hmm. so you've got that dial moving around and that's effectively what's going on with this watch. It's just on a larger scale. It's not a sub dial. It's on the full dial. Mm -hmm. And so the same as your 24 hour GMT hand would rotate. You would have this rotating. It just is going to move between one hour marker and the next over the course of 31 days. So in either case, it's fascinating. Yeah, very, very. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Um, I was just looking here. Um, the central hand indicates the current month through an instantaneous jump. So I think it would just sit in the middle. Okay. Okay. Whatever month it is. Got it. So it's not there. constantly moving. Okay. Yeah. Cause I'm slightly man, as the 30 like, days go on. If it did that, that'd be right. crazy for that price. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, that's exactly what I was thinking. I'm like, okay. So over the course of a year, this thing is going to take one trip around the dial, that hand. Mm hmm. Yeah. And, yeah, maybe someone that knows more about how watch movements and complications works is listening. They're like, you guys are idiots. It's not how that works. <laughs> but I'm like, I'm like, all right, how does this compare? It's like a GMT. Uh, it's like a fourth hand. OK. All right. Yeah, yeah man, that's a that's a cool watch. Definitely. Well, um, all right. So I can jump over to, one. to the speedy unless you have anything else. Do you got anything else on Constellation or it. GMT or OK? That should. Be well, yeah, it. so. We'll go ahead and jump into the last watch we're going to talk about today. Um, the Omega Speedmaster Professional. This is the Moon Watch. Really, it needs no introduction. So I'll go through specs really quickly here because that's not really what we're here to talk about. Um, stainless steel. And this is, I should say, this is one of the models that you don't, you're not going to find 200 variations of. You're going to find like seven. Uh, stainless steel, 42 millimeter in the current model. Uh, 13.2 millimeter case thickness. Water resistant to four, uh, sorry, to 50 meters. Uh, there's no water a, on the moon. Well, yeah, that's true. Wait, is it? No. <laughs> I'm an idiot. Maybe on the backside. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this uses the Omega 3861 coaxial movement, which like many of their other movements that we've already talked about is master chronometer certified. Uh, this actually beats at three Hertz. So 21,600, uh, vibration per hour. Kind of interesting. Um, compared to like a high beat, for example, like that I'm wearing mm-hmm. right now beats at 36,000 beats per hour. So, um, yeah, I'm really excited to get into that at a later episode. 
Uh, power reserve of 50 hours. We talked a little bit about that. Very nice. I think that hits the mark of kind of like the, you know, kind of like the lower end of like what you'd be looking for. Um, but the cost is like, I mean, it's one of the best things. I mean, if you want a new inbox with papers, if you just want your mm-hmm. own, if you're not looking at uh, vintage or special edition, 7,600 doesn't mean that's cheap. I mean, it's two yeah. X the cost of like a black Bay 58 basically before, and that's before taxes, but it's also, I mean, it's cheaper than almost any Rolex. It's mm-hmm. on par with most Breitlings, maybe a little bit higher, but you're getting a lot more, in my opinion. You're getting master chronometer coaxial movement um, for that adjusted yeah. or for that increase in price compared to like a Breitling. Um, so I'm sticking like Breitling Omega and Rolex in this kind of general discussion here. Um, and I always like to put like significant details about the watches that I'm going to discuss or that I like, I mean, this thing went to the moon guys, like Mm -hmm. (laughs) this thing lived on the moon or in orbit (laughs) for, uh, for a full year. Like, come on. It's one of the most recognizable watches in the world. Um, it's gotta be a top five, probably model ever. Um, you know, you're going 5711, probably Rolex Submariner. Speed, speedy it's got to be up there i mean like we're talking top three top five people so crazy crazy watch um i mean the speedy the moon watch whatever you want to call it snoopy um all sorts of names and special editions for this thing um and we already talked a little bit about how many models that omega creates and so we're not going to discuss all the special editions <clears throat> but um the 50th anniversary yeah. of apollo 2 did you have something on the apollo 2 or yeah, that was that was what I was gonna say. The the coolest thing to me is the anniversary of the fortieth with the Snoopy, yeah. and then the fiftieth, which is if I had to pick between, I would take this one just because the case back of it is so. I don't know if that's what you're about to lead. Wait, into. you take the the fortieth or fifty the the fiftieth uh, anniversary over the fortieth. Okay. The Snoopy is very cool, and seeing you know him <laughs> go over the moon is very cool, and especially yeah. for that, that was probably the coolest thing back then. But just more of a you know the history side of me and the less goofy side of me mm. um, with you yeah. know having the footprint looks like on the moon one small step for man one giant leap for mankind is just yeah. a very cool and i mean that's just a dope anniversary watch to keep pretty much in your case at all times <laughs> so i'm i'm a little torn and i was i was showing my wife some of these last night and i was like i was like yeah you know this is this is some of the things we're going to talk about and and some of the special edition ones and particularly these two the 40th and the 50th the 50th is a colorway that i think is more mass appealing like mm-hmm. by a long yeah, it's not stretch. Blue. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because, well, not only is it not blue, but the 40th, it's, it's a, it's basically, it's a white dial watch with blue sub dials and blue accents all over it. So mm-hmm. it's very contrasting. The case back though, if I had a preference, <laughs> I would stick the Snoopy case back on the 50th anniversary of Apollo 2. Obviously, that's not going to happen. There's really? no reason for it to happen. <laughs> I love the case back though. Like, that I mean, we talk about case backs, or we have. You love the Snoopy times. going over the moon, yeah, dude. It's <laughs> so cool. Like, how many times would you be yeah. taking that thing off your wrist and just, you know, in the middle of the day or you, looking you know, at you're slow at work? And <laughs> it's different. It's like, fun, like they said. Yeah, you, yeah, like a kid in a candy store. Come on, man. Mm-hmm. It's yeah, it's yeah, it's, fun. it's awesome. I mean, keeping things lighthearted, your, like they said. Yeah, exactly. I mean, to to your point though, the fiftieth is the more. Or, you know, I think, you know, something you were alluding to, at least it's the more mass appealing version of the two. And I definitely get mm-hmm. that. And that's why I like I say, like, if I had just one, it would be the 50th and not the 40th. Um, mm-hmm. But I mean, how cool is it that there's two special editions that people could debate that over? I mean, um, I don't think you can go wrong with like either one of them. And no, I just saw you talk about Teddy Baldazar. I just saw Kevin O'Leary and Teddy video. Of course, Kevin gets a Snoopy with a red strap for Shark Tank. Um <laughs> Which is just totally out, like white dial, blue accents, red strap, just so out there. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, a question before we kind of wrap up the current collection and wrap up the Speedy here. Um, I know we haven't really talked a whole lot about it, but like, I mean, it's so iconic. And there's, we could have talked for 45 minutes on this. Um, a bit of controversy I want to bring up the Moon Swatch. What is your sort of overall opinion or thought on that? If you don't have a very strong one, that's fine. I, a lot of people mm-hmm. don't, but I bring it up because I heard it phrased that it was smart on Omega's part 
because what they effectively did is they got their brand in front of people that are a little bit younger. Maybe they yeah. don't, or they have never considered watch collecting and watch buying or a high mm-hmm. horology or just anything like that. Maybe when I heard this and really thought about it, the way that I saw it was Swatch and Omega put their product at an affordable price in front of people that know probably two brands, maybe three. When it comes to like, you know, real luxury watch, Rolex, Richard Mill, and um, Audemars RPK, maybe Patek Philippe. Those four brands are probably recognizable to anybody in the world. Richard Mill being the exception. I think a lot of like Americans are really into Richard Mill. There's a lot of sponsorship. A lot of like like rappers and like music artists are really into Richard Mill. They also do a lot of sports stuff, you know, with very like, you know, very, very famous athletes. And I think mm-hmm. that Swatch put their product again in front of that crowd. They've probably or maybe yeah. never heard of Tissot, never heard of Longines, Grand Seiko, absolutely Tudor. None of this. And here's a $250 watch that's a special edition, I believe limited edition. And the way to get these watches is the same way you go get a new pair of sneakers when they drop. You're camping out in front of the store and you're breaking (laughs) down the door to get it. So much hype, so much. um, I mean, you call it call a spade a spade. I mean, controversy around that because you've got a brand like Omega that's done so much for the world of watchmaking and horology but they're stamping their logo and their stamp of approval on a $250 watch that is going to this crowd. So yeah. I can see it both ways and I think it's probably smart in the long term. I think it's smart on them for marketing it this way. Um that's all I'm going to say about it. Uh, I don't want to go too far back and forth for myself, but what are your thoughts there? Do you think it's smart that they marketed that or do you think it's maybe a Shot yourself think, in the foot situation. I think it's smart business wise, kind of like what I think the the guys of Monta said. They're like, "Hey, we sell watches that we think people are buying now. That's why they sold the baby blue, you know, the teal, whatever they called it. Um, the mint, you know, pastel is in right now, and they know people are buying it. And and Omega's like, "Hey, there's a market here that we haven't tapped in, and people want to say they own quote unquote an Omega, but they're 18." You know, so they're they're opening and they've just made yeah. a ton of money off of that they never would have seen before. So it's very smart business move yeah. wise. Um, now the the snob wise, they're gonna they're gonna sit there and hate on it and be oh my god, you can now buy a an Omega for two hundred fifty. But it's different than like saying you pay flip it on its head. Say you pay ten thousand dollars for a. Uh, Seiko or Citizen or Bulova or something. It's like, oh, you bought a ten thousand dollar watch from a brand that's known for making two hundred fifty. Omega will never fifty dollar watches. Omega will never be known for making two hundred fifty dollar watches. <laughs> you know, so I think I think it was smart business wise. You know, the critics yeah. are always going to sit there and whine. I don't really care. I would never buy one personally. But I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say when we weren't at one of the Atlanta Watch Society things and they're giving one away that I wouldn't have loved it. I would have loved having it and i would have probably worn it a time oh, or two i was like, like hey, i want it, it, I want it. <laughs> yeah exactly but yeah. i'm not gonna sit there and go out of my way i would wear it i mean one, so. yeah I, I would wear them but i'm not i'm not doing like i'm i don't know maybe i'm too old like shit man i'm 30 and now it does come off as that i'm 30 i'm 29 i'm not that old but it does come off as like a not a try hard but like you know a guy could be wearing that and trying to pass it off as a true speed master and you know if somebody calls you oh my god this guy's trying to act like he owns a speed yeah but if you get some like crazy colored one like the yellow one because they come out with all these crazy ass colors it's not like they copy just the speedy look um if i have a yellow one i think that's the one that was being given away it was a yellow one nobody's ever gonna think that's a speedy and it's just something different and, uh, you know, yeah. I don't I don't have a super strong opinion on it. I think it was smart business wise, made them a lot of money, I'm sure. But, you know, they knew they were going to catch flack on it. So and they did. But yeah. who cares? That's past. Nobody cares anymore. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and I, I also wonder if like if the market that they that they presented to and that they eventually sold to. I wonder also if that creates like future, you know, future watch collectors. Like definitely. I mean, if someone's yeah. like 18 or. 15 like i don't you know i don't know like i'm out of touch with reality i don't i don't have kids so i'm like i don't well yet <laughs> so i'm like i don't know if uh if like 15 year olds are like hey mom dad could i have 250 for this watch 
because everyone else is doing it. Like, I don't know. But um, I guess think of like the long game, like 10, 15 years down the road. Like, I don't know, maybe some maybe some kid that, you know, went to one of those stores is going to pull out that swatch box because they all come in these really cool, like commemorative and collective or uh, collectible Mm -hmm. boxes, you know, like they'll pull that out and they're like, oh, yeah, that's cool. You know, maybe it will start. So, you know, maybe in the long term um, that creates some some like watch enthusiasts that uh, they quit selling otherwise never would have looked. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I I know the newest one popular and worth more. Yeah. Yeah. I know the newest one does look very speedy. The one it just was making the rounds like a week or so ago. So sometime in May of this year, Um, but Mm -hmm. it is black and I think it just has a gold second hand. And that was like the differentiating because I think there already is a black one. And then I think this one mm-hmm. it was black. It was the same thing. Literally, it was just a gold second hand, but it was like a new release. It was a new edition, and of course, it was limited. So all the it was the same thing again. It was like a year later, they went out and they did the same thing. They slapped a gold uh, second hand on, and they got the hype right back up. So I'll wait to see before I pass too much judgment. I think that it can be a really good play for them in the long term. I think marketing wise, hey, if you want to get your brand in front of anyone, whatever. It's not like they're making just complete crap. They're not ripping off another brand. Like um, Mm -hmm. it's probably not for most collectors, but for some collectors, or if you're young and you don't want to drop even 700 on a TSO, dude, go get your moon swatch. Like go do it. Like it's, it's still a piece of like watching her horological history as crazy as that might sound. It still is. It's a collective piece. So I don't want to throw too much shade on it. Um, Mm. But if we get two, three years down the road and they're still doing these drops where like, I just said the word drops, like they're sneakers or something. Um, then I think maybe, maybe they'll get a lot of pushback because I don't think that people are going to be very fond of that. Um, where they're playing this game. You said the Monta guys were talking about their, um, about their pastel colors. Like I see that as a game from Omega. If you're playing this game of like, Oh, we're going to change this one thing. Or we just, you know, we made a yellow one two years ago, so we're going to do the yellow one, but change the subdial color and drop another 5,000 of them again, have everyone beaten down the doors and all that. Then I think people really have a problem with it. But yeah, we'll see. We'll see. All Maybe right. It's well, let's soon. get to mailbag or mail time. What, what do we call it? The new thing that I wasn't told about? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, mailbag is always like, that sounds funny. Like. We'll have a bag mail here. Bag. <laughs> mail time. <laughs> it's mail time. Was that the Blues Clues? <laughs> that, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it was. Yeah. I love Blues Clues uh, as a kid. Yeah. Um, all right. So, uh, so we did get one question in that I wanted to bring up during this episode. Question is, if you were limited to a two watch collection, which, which watches would make the cut? I'm going to take this to mean that they're talking about your two in your collection. So let's say pick two from your collection or pick two of just whatever. Um, I'll leave that up to you if you want to do in your collection or two watches of whatever for the rest of your life. And that's it. That's all you get. I would let's do. I mean, yeah, we could either do two watches from whatever brand or we can keep this Omega centric and let's do it both ways and say two Omegas. What are you buying? Um, real quick, I know we're running long on time here. Um, two Omegas, if I could pick any two and nobody else has any, I would definitely stick with the World Time Aquaterra, like you said, and the Speedmaster. The Speedmaster, obviously, if I can just get crazy, then the Speedmaster 50th anniversary. But saying that's right. already out and not being sold anymore, just the Speedmaster. Um, all time. God, that's a good one. You say you say what your two Omegas would be in while well, I think. My two Omegas would definitely be... Um, I, I'll go in a different direction than David. Um, David is shooting for the stars. I would love to do that. Uh, so I'll just give a little bit different flair. Um, I would go Aquaterra and Speedy. And I would keep it really basic, really clean. I'm going to say current, like current generation, current model, uh, speedy, uh, black dial with the sapphire crystal and Aquaterra. If I could just have any model of the kind of normal Aquaterras, it would be that green that's like two, three years old. And again, from what I can tell, discontinued, not the olive, but the more traditional green dial with the teak pattern. Those would be my two. And then, yeah. 
and then I, I can I can I can double it up here and then kick it back to you and we'll and we'll wrap up after that. Um, if it was two two watches of any brand, and I'm gonna stay kind of mainstream by that I mean like not crazy crazy collectible and crazy vintage stuff or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Just a two watch. I mean, I feel like you have to have a sport. You have to have like a diver or a chronograph in there. So. No, 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 no. Doing it out. S- screw that. Uh, I'm going uh, Rolex GMT Master 2. Uh, Starbucks, if you give me the option. But Rolex GMT Master 2, that's going to be my sport watch. And then... Hot take. A watch that I actually own. Because every time I wear it... I, sa- I know I said this about the bamboo. It's just the Grand Seiko uh, effect. It's the SB uh, GM 221. It's the... Um, GMT, the cream ivory dial GMT. You are p- dress- putting that as one of your two ever. I'm staying. Really? I'm staying grounded here. If you want to go 5711 right. and Audemars PK uh, Royal Oak, well, then t- you go not for even it. saying that. But I'm just. <laughs> I mean, obviously, if you're <laughs> crazy. I'll do the day, the day, date, diamond hour, market solid <laughs> gold, and then the 5711. Yeah, but but Sears. Okay, interesting. I did not so, think you were going right, that right, hold on. So, the Starbucks so the way, I get because I know you do love the Starbucks. But. Yeah. So the way that I'm thinking about this is like any two watch collection that I could reasonably uh, obtain right now or that I could have in the next, like, let's say three or five years. A watch collection that's that you the could model have that I'm going. in your lifetime. I'm saying in your lifetime, like, hey, I might buy this when I'm 50, but it's obtainable. Like a 5711, I'm probably never going to freaking buy. I mean, that's just stupid expensive. If I have no. that much money, I'm throwing that somewhere to make me more money, not on a watch. <laughs> um, yeah. Unless I won the lottery. But, you know, a watch I think is definitely obtainable, which I think would be on my max I would ever pay for a watch, would be you hit that $40,000 mark which is, you know, some of you buy in your 50s, 60s, you've saved a lot of money. And then uh, do you want to go the solid gold Submariner route or do you want to go the solid gold day date? And I think I want to do the day date, like I just said. Day date, um, black all day. dial. Yeah, black dial um, with the diamond hour markers. It's beautiful. I saw one. It's heavy watch. The only downfall of that, again, no loom. But I know when I said that last time, you laughed at me and said, well, you have diamonds, so I think you'll be all right. Yes. <laughs> but um, I would definitely Diamonds that are one. a perfectly acceptable then, replacement for loom. <laughs> <laughs> and then, honestly, I, God, then I'm torn. You know, honestly, what I think I would do, which you could still wear this watch with a suit because I wear my black Submariner with a suit all the time. And that's fine. I would, I'd stick with Rolex and I do the white gold blue dial Submariner. White gold blue dial. So it's oh, like, yeah. imagine, okay. it yeah, looks yeah. just like Is a black Submariner with a blue dial, but yes, the Smurf. Okay. So, so it's blue dial. Blue so dial. the white gold actually looks like stainless steel. You know, if they yeah. had a stainless steel with a blue dial, I would just do that, but they don't, they only do with a blue bezel on the black dial which i don't really like yeah um, i would do those two and they would cover my blue and my black that i always talk about because i wear a lot of blues i wear a lot of blacks and you cover both bases and uh, i would go from there okay cool well um i'm not going to name drop the guy that uh asked us that question but i will apologize to you for us rambling we just gave you like 12 watches in a two watch collection so next time we'll come <laughs> better prepared and uh we'll we'll maybe We'll maybe take what you guys give us and we'll add some parameters to that. <laughs> we'll say like under 20 K <laughs> or something like that. So we do apologize, but uh, no, I mean, I think that's, that's like a good exercise, right? Like you have like a grounded collection. You have mm-hmm. like, Hey, when I'm 50, this is, this is like what I'm gunning for, which perfectly fine. So it's all fun at games here. Um, yeah. Anything else you got on Omega or uh, anything else we talked about? I think that's it. I mean, I think we've hit everything. Um, obviously, okay. like I said, there'll be 15 other things we'll talk about Omega down the road. And I know these, you know, we talk about brands all the time, but then we'll still throw in stuff from past episodes into these. So, uh, but I think it's a great brand. Obviously, probably will be the next brand I buy. I say that. I don't know. I say that every damn episode. But, you know, know. Rolex or Omega, <laughs> those, are, those are the top two. Again, I, I truly believe, though, what I said at the beginning of this episode, where this is a brand 
that you own and it's like at the pinnacle it's right there with rolex oh you own a mega dang okay and yeah. you know it's very affordable and they have great watches they this is a hundred percent if you said all i can wear are omegas i'd be more than happy because they're all great it's a great brand it's freaking joe rogan's best favorite brand so there you go that's all you need to know there we go interesting i didn't i didn't see you going that way or that direction but i appreciate that um <laughs> Yeah, I, I think we'll we probably have like three episodes more to cover this brand. Mm-hmm. Um, I know we hit on like two of the most iconic today with the Speedy and the S and P three hundred, but uh, there's just I mean there's so much to cover. So uh, more to come on that front. We don't know when it could be in six months from now. It could be in like three or four months. I like honestly really don't know, but there's just a ton. To your point, yeah, it's it's one of those pinnacle brands. It's yeah, I would I would love to own one. I will own an Aquatair at some point in my life, I'm sure. Um, but we'll see when that day comes. So uh, for now, we're going to sign off. Uh, we appreciate you guys reaching out to us. Um, like I said on the giveaway earlier, make sure you follow at Strap and Link on Instagram. Go ahead and like the post that we will share out. Obviously, it's not right now when I'm speaking, but just a reminder, follow us, like that post, go ahead and comment uh, and tag a friend as well. And we'll select that and then we'll let you guys know once we're peaking at 350 followers on instagram we're going to be announcing or letting you guys know hey we're getting close to it um and then yeah of course if you could just subscribe give us a rating give us a review all of that stuff helps like you guys would have no idea how much that stuff helps so if you could do that or just share some clips like to your instagram story just kind of get the word out man um tell any of your friends your wives your husbands brothers sisters if hey if they're into watches let them know we just got a couple of casual guys talking about watches hanging out over here um with that i think that's all we've wrapped up today we appreciate you hanging out this is probably our longest episode yet we'll try to keep them a little bit shorter or maybe we'll go longer in the next one who knows these good brands they deserve to be longer this is true this is very true there's a lot to cover here so everyone have a great uh, rest of your week 